Two behaviorists named Fred and John meet at a party. Fred says to John, you're fine. How am I? Now, that was a joke. And if you didn't quite get that joke, it's probably because you need to learn more about behaviorism. So I'll go ahead and give you that joke again at the end of this video after we've talked a little bit more about what behaviorism is. Now, what I'll do is I'll talk about four main contributors to behaviorism in the past century. But before I do that, let's go ahead and talk about five main ideas behind behaviorism. Number one is that the study of behavior should be a natural science, and thus it should use the scientific method to study behavior. Number two is that behavior is shaped by its consequences, which would include rewards and punishments. Number three, mental processes such as thoughts and feelings can never be directly observable and therefore should be excluded in trying to understand behavior. Number four, that in order to understand learning, we need to understand both operant and classical conditioning. And number five, because the environment plays a major role in the shaping of behavior, if we want to have prediction and control of behavior, we'll then need to manipulate the environment. So how did behaviorism come about? Well, towards the end of the 19th century, one of the things that was really fascinating to, to people in Europe and in North America was the behavior of animals, cats and dogs and other animals that they might come in contact with. And there was just this flurry of interest in the natural abilities of cats and dogs and how intelligent they were and so on. And people would send in anecdotes to magazines and other places talking about the special feat of their horse, their cat, their dog, whatever it was. And then other people would try to make sense of it. And comparative psychology grew up around this time uh, where professors in different universities started to collect those anecdotes and then write books about what we knew about the intelligence of different kinds of animals. But that all changed around 1900 when comparative psychologists started moving away from just using anecdotes and looking at behavior in the laboratory. One of the first people to do this was Edward Lee Thorndike. Thorndike was an American who studied learning in chickens while he was working on his dissertation at Harvard University. He later moved to Columbia to finish his dissertation and he added cats to the mix. So for instance, with the cats, what he would do is make puzzle boxes for the cat, where he put a cat inside the box and the cat had to figure out how to escape the box. And it could do this perhaps in one puzzle box by pulling on a string and pushing a lever and putting its paw through some little hole. And so eventually the cats would learn how to get out of those puzzle boxes. And what Thorndike observed about both his chickens and his cats was that learning took place through trial and error. And that he soon realized that Pretty much all animals learn through trial and error rather than some sort of innate intelligence or some sort of consciousness. As a result of these sort of systematic observations that he was making of his cats and chickens, he proposed two laws of learning. The first one was the law of effect. And the law of effect has to do with the relationship between the stimulus and the response and what happens afterwards. So here we have the stimulus and it could be, for instance, a lever or a string hanging inside the puzzle box. And then the response would be what the animal does in response to that stimulus. So perhaps the cat puts its paw up on the lever and by putting the paw on the lever, it causes the lever to open up the door and the cat can escape. So what immediately would happen afterwards is something satisfying. It would be called a satisfier because you, the cat, would feel good after it had performed this particular response to the stimulus. And that means that the next time that the cat was in that box and saw that same lever, it'd probably be more likely then to also again use its paw on that lever and open up the box. So satisfiers increase our tendency to want to make the same response to the stimulus. Contrary to that would be annoyers, is what Thordyke called them, which would mean that you've gone ahead and performed this response, but something annoying happened where afterwards as a consequence. So for example, maybe the cat sees the lever, but this time it brushed its tail against the lever and nothing happened. And so therefore the cat is frustrated, it's still stuck inside this box, it's annoying. So the next time it sees its lever, it's gonna be less likely to brush its tail against the lever. Now, of course, the number of times that you have these experiences is going to also strengthen or weaken the response. And so the second law that he proposed was called the law of exercise, which basically said the more trials you have of learning, 
the stronger you're gonna learn this particular response. So if you've had several times where you saw the stimulus, then there was the response and it was followed by a satisfier, and you've done that many times over many trials, you're gonna get really good at it. It's gonna be a really strong connection between the S and the R. Likewise, if you've had many occasions to go ahead and have the response to the stimulus followed by the annoyer, the annoyer is gonna also strengthen the fact that you're probably not going to be making that response then to the stimulus, or I should say it really weakens it greatly, even more so, because you've had so many times to practice uh, making this bad response that led you to have this annoying consequence. So those are the two main things that Thorndike proposed and then contributed to the learning of animals. And you can see this is a marked difference from what was going on before that, where people were just focused really on these anecdotes about the abilities of their animals. Now Thorndike has introduced a way that you can systematically study behavior of animals in the laboratory. And that leads us to our second main contributor to behaviorism, and that's Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov was a Russian physiologist who was originally born to a family of 11 children, and his parents were both peasants who worked on the fields, and they didn't own the land. Uh, his father was the village priest, his mother was the daughter of a village priest, and it was expected that Ivan would go off to seminary and become a priest himself. So he goes off to seminary school to become a priest, but while he's there, he comes across many scientific works, including Darwin's Origin of Species. And this ignited his interest in science even more, and he eventually dropped out of seminary and was able to secure a fellowship to attend St. Petersburg's University as a medical student. Now this took him several years to work on this fellowship and uh, to continue to do his studies. In order to support himself, he had to take on a different research assistantships and even became the director of a laboratory while he was still an undergraduate. Eventually, he was offered his own laboratory as a professor at the St. Petersburg Military and Medical Academy. And what was he working on? Well, what he had chosen to start working on years before was the digestive tract. And now that he had his own laboratory, he completely spent all of his time on digestion. And it's this work that he did on digestion that led him to win the Nobel Prize in physiology in 1904. What he did in physiology is that he would work with dogs, creating little fistulas along the digestive tract. And so a fistula is like a little surgical opening that he could then insert like a little tube in there and collect some juices or whatever the things were that were happening at digestion at that particular point. And he did this so expertly that his dogs could live for many, many years and not suffer any, any infections or whatever. And became, he became quite successful at then studying digestion using this method of fistulas. While he was doing this work, he also came upon this phenomenon that he originally called psychic secretions. What he discovered was that dogs could be trained to associate a neutral stimulus, such as the sound of a bell, with the presentation of food. This would cause the dogs to salivate in response to the sound of the bell, even if no food was present. This groundbreaking work in classical conditioning is really, really important, and we still talk about it today in many different ways. Pavlov's work then has not only had a significant impact on psychology, it's also impacted physiology, medicine, and other sciences. And this work on classical conditioning has lots of applications to education and even therapy. Person number three is John Watson. John Watson was also an American psychologist who received his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1903. Watson is best known for his influential 1913 paper, Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It, in which he outlined his views of behaviorism in sort of like a manifesto. According to Watson, behaviorism is the study of observable behavior rather than internal mental states, and this would be the way we should understand then and explain human behavior. He believed that behavior could be predicted and controlled through the manipulation of external stimuli and that the study of psychology then should be focused on observable behaviors rather than introspection or the study of consciousness. His views on behaviorism had a significant impact on the field of psychology, particularly in the areas of education and in child development. He believed that these principles of behaviorism could be used to shape and control the behavior of children, and he ended up writing very popular books on how to care and raise children using behavioristic principles. 
He also made contributions to the field of advertising. He worked at an advertising agency for many years. And while he was there, he introduced the idea of using celebrity endorsements as a way of like conditioning you to like the product because you like this celebrity already. And so therefore these advancements that he made in advertising and in consumer psychology are still considered some of the first real scientific work on those fields. Despite his influential contributions to the field of psychology, however, his views on behaviorism were criticized by many of his peers. Some people argue that his approach was too simplistic and it failed to take into account the complexity of human behavior and all of our various mental states. And there was also a real denial of discussing things like free will and what it meant to have free will. So our last person I want to talk about is B.F. Skinner, who also as a behaviorist tried to deal with these more complex issues. And he also even talked about free will at some point. B.F. Skinner, the B stands for Burris and the F was Fred, and he was actually known as Fred Skinner in his lifetime. He was an American psychologist and a behaviorist who is known for his work in operant conditioning. He developed a theory of radical behaviorism, which states that behavior is mainly shaped by the consequences that follow it. So he was a big admirer of the work of Thorndike. So one of his main contributions was operant conditioning. And he believed that behavior is shaped by these consequences that follow it, and that reinforcement or punishment can be used to increase or decrease the likelihood of the behavior. The way he studied this was he developed something that's now known as the Skinner box, which was a box where he could place a rat or a pigeon, and the animal could therefore be presented different kinds of stimuli like sounds or visual stimuli. And then there was also some place for the animal to respond, like by pressing a lever or pressing a button. And then you could reward the animal by, for instance, giving it food. So these are the elements that could be then automatically controlled in the experiment. And therefore you could watch the animal's behavior over several hours to, as it did numbers of trials, trying to learn how to successfully get more and more food. Another important concept developed by Skinner is the notion of shaping, which is molding behavior through rough approximations of what it is that you're trying to ultimately get the animal to do. So you might start out with something really small, like just try to get the pigeon to go near the light. And then once the pigeon's going near the light, you reinforce it. And then you say, okay, now I'm not gonna get reward the pigeon until it gets brushes up against the light and then reinforce it. So eventually you get the pigeon to start pecking the light through these successive approximations called shaping. And this is a very powerful technique that's been used with both animals and with humans. And so shaping is one of those things we credit to B.F. Skinner. He also introduced this concept of schedules of reinforcement, which included things like continuous reinforcement, intermittent reinforcement, and variable ratio schedules. So his work has had a tremendous impact in the fields of education and applied behaviors. He developed techniques for teaching new behaviors through positive reinforcement and shaping, which has been widely used in classrooms. His work has also influenced the development of behavior modification programs for individuals with developmental disabilities and mental health disorders. Overall, you can see that his contributions to psychology have had a really huge impact on the field of psychology and are widely used today in research and in practice. I'll soon post a video just devoted to the work of B.F. Skinner because there's so much to cover. So if you'd like to learn more about that, hopefully I'll have a link in the description to that other video, or maybe you'll see it at the end of this video. But look for it somewhere in my channel. I'll definitely have a video about Skinner for your further enjoyment. So let's go back to that joke that I had at the beginning. Two behaviorists, Fred and John, meet at a party, and Fred says to John, you're fine, how am I? Yeah, get the joke? I hope you do. Now, if you're interested in the history of psychology generally, I have a whole playlist of lectures and other videos about the history of psychology. I also have just videos about psychology in general that you could watch. I also do videos on neuroscience and academia, so I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel and give this video a like, and I'll see you again next time.